Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and today I have a very special guest on my podcast. I have Mark Carnes. He is professor of history at Barnard and Columbia. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's so good to have you on. So for those of you who do not know who Mark Carnes is, he is, would you say that you're the, the, the main man behind reacting to the past? I, I probably began the concept, but... Hundreds of uh, professors have joined it and taken the idea that, that I had a glimmer of an idea and they took it uh, and and turned it into something uh, that's far beyond anything I could have imagined on my own. So you have spearheaded an so I'm sorry, Yeah, spearheaded. That's a nice verb. Yeah. <laughs> so why don't you give us a rundown of exactly what reacting to the past is? All right. I'll try to do it without giving a, a, a big lecture. It's... Uh, Reacting to the past consists of complex games set in the past in which students take on roles informed by important texts. So uh, we create his, we put students in historical scenarios and um, after a couple of setup sessions where they're introduced to the historical context and the ideas and the texts behind it, they'll then be plunged into that situation and they'll then try to win the game. It's really a uh, live action role playing game um, of, a of a fairly complex and fairly prescribed character. That is to say, the game books consist of about 100,000 words of text and materials and uh, the published games, and we've now have 29 published games consist of another uh, 100,000 words of roles and then another 100,000 words of instructions for the, for the instructors. So these are quite complex. Uh, they could range from uh, taking students and plunging them into ancient Athens after Athens has lost the Peloponnesian War. And the question is, should Athens restore the democracy that lost the war to Sparta, or should should they get rid of the democracy? Should they use something else? Or a game set in the midpoint of the French Revolution, should the revolution proceed in a more radical way to eliminate the monarchy? Should it stay where it is with a constitutional monarchy? Should it has it gone too far? Should it should it uh, uh, go back and restore some of the old order? Um, Games set in uh, India on the eve of independence. Should Britain give the Indian subcontinent independence? If so, should it uh, uh, leave the South Asian subcontinent as a single entity? Should it be divided into a Muslim Pakistan and then Hindu India? Um, what should happen. And so we choose historical scenarios, usually where there are big decisions to be made, and also where there are lots of big ideas that are at play, so that students in playing the game will have to contend with complex historical materials and also big ideas, such as in, in ancient Athens, is is the direct democracy, is that a good thing? Um, is rule by expert, uh, well-to-do people, is that wiser? That's the sort of big idea. In the French Revolution, it's the big ideas are, can you create new governmental system based on an abstract ideas like Rousseau's social contract, or as Edmund Burke, the conservative philosopher, argues, do human institutions have to evolve gradually over time? In India, the a whole bunch of similarly important ideas, um, ranging from from Gandhi's notion of uh, uh, a nation emerging through civil disobedience and nonviolence to to Hindu ideologies, some of whom claim that the reason India had lost to the Muslims and to the British was the lack of military ardor and a need to revitalize uh, uh, Hindu nationalism. So uh, contending ideas of all sorts of uh, are, are at the heart of what the students will be arguing and what they'll be writing their papers on, all in an attempt to win the game. So that's basically creating these situations and then uh, an entire pedagogy 
based on this concept um, that, that that has evolved a great deal in the past in the past uh, twenty years. So yeah, I mean, clearly something like this, you know, that many words can't just spring forth from nothing. So how did you get the idea to push role playing that is this advanced in your classroom? Yeah, Liz, that's a terrific question. It's a terrific insight that I had no no idea back in 1996 when I happened upon this. And and what ha- uh, this is a story that's in Minds on Fire. But um, uh, I was a professor. I had uh, gotten tenure at at, uh, at Columbia, and so this was sort of one of my career dreams. I was chair of the department and. Uh, Everything seemed to be going swimmingly for me, okay? But I realized one day that I I had a class. It was a class, a seminar. And I dreaded going to it because I was bored. And I got there late because I sort of shambled across the, uh, the, the courtyard to get there. And at the end of the class... I invited students to, because I thought, wait a minute, here, I'm a good teacher. I've got really smart kids. The seminar was on the the, the big ideas in, in Western civilization. And so I had good students. I was a good teacher. Um, and I was dealing with important ideas, the masterworks of, 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 of actually multiple civilizations. And how, how did I have a, how was it boring? So I asked all the students on that class individually to meet with me the next semester. And I met with several students. And then there was one student I remember in particular. And she was curious why I would called, called her in. And I said, well, because, you know, I'm trying to figure out why the class went bad. She said, what do you mean it wasn't a bad class? And I said, yes, it, it was a boring class. She said, no, it wasn't boring. I said, I was bored. You were bored. You could feel the boredom in the room. <laughs> and she looked up at the books. And she said, well, you know, yeah, but all classes are sort of boring. Yours was less boring than most. And that reminded me of my undergraduate experience, which was all classes were sort of boring. And so I thought that something's wrong. So I, I but that doesn't lead to this new idea. This, this, so I decided to take the big ideas and do them as a, put them in, into a debating format where it'd be less, less, uh, less boring. And in one of the debates, which was set in in a, in in a setting in Ming China, where one of the students was the the Ming Emperor in 1587, another student was the first Grand Secretary, and the others were members of the of the uh, Han Lin Academy, which were the the basically the the uh, cabinet of the Ming Dynasty. Um, and, and they were debating the analects of Confucius as it applied to a particular historical situation. And the first session went fine, I thought. It was, it, was a, it was a good debate. But the student who was the emperor and the first grand secretary came up to afterwards and said, this isn't the way it would have been in Ming China. They're making jokes. They're, they're making fun of us. They wouldn't have done that in Ming China. We could have put them to death instantly. <laughs> and I, I said... Well, Confucius had the idea that you use rituals to induce psychological states so that one of the reasons you have mourning rituals when someone dies and or you prostrate yourself before superiors is so you'll feel mourning or you'll feel a sense of, of inferiority to a superior person. If you're down on your knees, you'll, you'll start to feel... Um, maybe you should impose some Ming rituals on them. And they said you would make the students bow down to to to, to Pervy, who was the emperor. And I said, sure, if it if it's in accord with Ring with Ming uh, 
traditions. So they spent the weekend studying Ming rituals. And one student announced at the beginning of class, and the emperor wasn't in the class. The, the first grand secretary said, here, here are the rules we're going to fall. This, 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 you can't make jokes. You, uh, you cannot look at the emperor. There can be no side conversations. And um, if anyone violates any of these things, you'll be exiled from the room. And because your grade depends on class participation, your grade will suffer. <laughs> now, I didn't agree to any of this. And so my sort of jaw dropped. And one of the students said, she can't do that, can she? And I said, well, of course she can. She's the emperor. She can do whatever. This it really That was really the beginning of reacting. So eventually then the student comes in and several of them stand. The two who, two who were unsure about this, who are critics of the emperor and the first grand secretary, one said, well, I don't want my grade to suffer. And so they both stand. The debate begins. Someone cracks a joke. And the first grand secretary said, cut it out. Any more of that, you're out of the room. And everybody looks at me. And I just scribble. And then what happened is that the discussion continued as before, but everybody's focused on the student leaders. And I tried to join in, and I realized that joining in, I was somehow interrupting things. The next class, which was a continuation of the last, and the, the, it was dealing with new issues, but the same, same sort of philosophical orientations, I pushed my chair back a few feet, and they didn't seem to notice that I wasn't participating. The next class, I push my chair to the wall, and it was magical in that the debate had a new intensity, and it was unlike any class I'd ever seen where students were fully engaged. They were competing in, in levels that were unlike the sort of showy, show-off competition you see in a, in a, in a, in a classroom seminar. Um, and someone said, does anyone realize this class was supposed to end seven minutes ago? And we looked at the clock and it had been like you were at a movie theater where, you know, when a movie ends and it's really good movie and you then sort of feel embarrassed that you're someplace else and now you're in this other room with other people looking at you and, you know, it was that sort of feeling that, that we had not been in Ming China, but we had not been in the classroom. And that was really the beginning of reacting was the idea that if students ran the class, that you would be dealing with the level of dynam emotional dynamics and personal interpersonal dynamics that were potentially capable of solving one of the real problems with education, which is that to listen to the expert teach you is inevitably pretty boring. But the problem is, how do students run the class if they don't know the material? And the solution became to, to basically create an intellectual structure, a mansion of, of content, and then to push students into the mansion and have them motivated enough to explore it. And they would learn the material while exploring it, but they'd also learn a hell of a lot more about, about leadership, about teamwork, about how to speak and persuade and do research and solve problems. And, and that, that basically has been the task of reacting is, is creating these games, these, these intellectual mansions and finding the inducements to, to get students to want to explore them. Now, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the more visible ad advocates of a pedagogy that is against the instructor lecturing. And I've just given you five minute lecture. So apologies to you and your listeners. <laughs> so I actually do have a question about this. So as an educator, um, especially as a high school educator now, uh, I get observed, I feel a really strong compulsion to never be caught sitting at my desk. Uh, that is definitely, you know, the trend among teachers now is active teaching and being out there among your students. Um, what is the role of the expert in the room for reacting because clearly you can't just put anybody in that room to run the game for the kids and expect it to work. 
So what what does this demand of the instructor as a process? So so what the instructor what the instructor does, and it's it's um one of the reasons that reacting has taken off and spread, and it's now used at five hundred colleges and probably you know, 1,300, 1,500 professors use it as instruction, and, and there are hundreds of high schools that are um, where high school instructors want to use it. And for, for, for nearly two decades, we didn't allow high schools to use it, but now we've got an ex- exploratory group to, uh, to, to see about using it in high schools. Um, what the instructor, that we, and the reason it spread is that they, instructor's relationship with students is entirely different. So you're not teaching during the class in the same way. You'll be passing notes or if with the advent of online, you'll be sending lots of little message encouragements. You've made an argument there. Um, are you trying to make an argument on this? You might want to look at this passage in this book. Um, but the main thing is that you've got a faction that's got a big problem and they can't figure out what to do. And you'll schedule time, uh, maybe during class, maybe the, the, usually before a game begins, there will be just faction meeting times, and you'll meet with the factions. You'll cheerlead them. You'll raise, you'll help them uh, through ideas. And then when the game begins, where they're contending with other students and they're trying to give persuasive speeches, they're trying to win the game, and they've got messy, complicated, difficult problems to write their papers, to give their speeches, but also to win. And you as the instructor, you'll strategize, help them strategize. And it is the most exhilarating teaching because they're motivated. It's not you trying to, here's content, listen to me, memorize it. It's you've got a problem. And to solve the problem, you need to figure out these things. And because they really, really want to defeat Faction X, which is led by by Kathy or by by uh, um, Alonzo, um, they're motivated to do things that I could never, ever get them to do. So the instructor, the instructor will, during classes, will, you haven't said anything. Um, You might want to make this point Mm -hmm. or look at page four of your role sheet. Uh, It addresses the issue that you were, you, you struggled with, or look at this. You might want to look at Analect, in book two of, of, of the Analects of Confucius, that sort of makes the point that you're trying to find a source for. So, so there's a lot of guidance. Um, note passing during the during the classes, uh, cheerleading, and um, strategizing with factions after classes or before classes, and then grading papers quickly because they need them. Uh, they need your input. To, to to solve to solve the issues, it's a very it's an exhilarating sort of, a sort of teaching where you're you're not downloading information which most of which is being forgotten. You're helping students who are chewing with difficult problems that are important to their life. Alonzo's faction has been really really tough on them. They've been tearing them apart and tearing your faction apart, and they've been winning winning debates and winning these preliminary steps that are helping them winning, win the game. How do we turn that back? That sort of motivation is just glorious to work with. So basically what you're doing is you're taking on a coaching role and you're kind of helping guide students towards the sources that are going to help. And that actually leads to another question that I had, which is when you are letting students control the game, that's a good thing for their autonomy, but also I'm sure that as an instructor, you want them to hit upon certain problems you want to make sure that they got exposed to certain texts and sources and ideas. How do you balance between molding what you as the expert want your students to see and have access to with their freedom within the game? With, and that's, that's a wonderful question. So so you the, you create the game and it, and it doesn't get published. Most of these games have been seven or eight years in development and they've been test played by, they've been test played by, uh, 30 or 40 classes, and then they played by faculty. So you get, and different students will take, classes will take a game in different directions. So part of the, sometimes they'll take it where you don't want it to go. You've got a, you're creating an intellectual, intellectual structure. And over the years, it becomes 
a more rigid and more carefully decorated. So you sort of know what what rooms they're going to and what things they're exploring. If they stick in one room and they don't go into another room, which is important for you with content, you change the game around. You change the victory objectives to, to emphasize that they have to go to this other room. Um, and so a lot of that is just good game design to to make sure you've got everything there and that it's part of all the victory objectives, not only for Alonzo's team to go there, but for the, the team that's against him. So that when they go there, the, the, there will then be uh, sparks. There'll be the sort of dramatic sparks that create interest. And whenever there's dramatic sparks, then you'll have interest and passion and emotional involvement. Um, and, and we've learned over time how to understand how to make those rooms enticing. Uh, sometimes students won't go there and you sort of ha have to be heavy handed. Uh, your paper didn't touch on this. And so you got a B minus. Um, you need to go there further. I mean, so that's, that's sometimes the nudging can be heavy handed like that. But that's, that's a sign of a bad game that you have to force them into that other room. Usually you you create the structure and make it enticing so that they'll go to all the rooms. <laughs> that also actually leads me to another question, which is how do you assess student work in this kind of context? I mean, clearly you can't, you know, give a worse grade to the students who lose or something like that. So what are they producing for you that is gradable, you know, according to university standards? Yeah, another excellent question. And for the most part, it's... The, that most of what they're doing, not all, but most, and it depends on the game, of course, but most of what they're doing is they're making arguments and they're making the arguments in class. So often they will have a paper that will be the basis for their oral argument. Um, so in, in Athens, most of the, in ancient Athens, most of the uh, discussion was in the, in the assembly, which was the open air assembly where 6,000 Athenian males would debate policy and vote on it in the spot. So most of the student papers in that game are the drafts, are their speeches that they give in the Phoenix. In other games, they'll be writing constitutions, they'll be writing um, uh, policy proposals, but most of the papers will be arguments and most of the grading then is based on those with those written papers. We recommend that two thirds of the grade be uh, um, written work and then one third class participation. Class participation is often very, very high. So basically, a lot of the work they're producing is going to look a lot like your standard essay with a thesis that you're typically being taught to create in late high school and at the university. It's just that the way you get to your arguments is more interactive. Right. And you, you, you've got a goal and your goal is to get people to in, the, in ancient Athens to vote this way on this issue. Should you give um, foreign born medics, that's to say foreign-born people who are contributing to the economy of Athens, should they have, should they be allowed to come into the Phoenix to, to, to that's just one of the issues in trying to re reconstruct the democracy that had failed um, against Sparta. So that's the sort of issue that, that they would be writing article, uh, essays pro and con based on what their victory objective is. Some groups don't want foreign-born people to have uh, citizenship rights, some do. So then they will use historical materials, um, their knowledge of Athens, their sense of how to make a persuasive argument to students playing these roles. Uh, that's, that's the main sort of paper. So... I also find this interesting, this, this idea of increased classroom participation, because actually one of the challenges that I have as a teacher is getting my students to speak up in class. They are very shy about it. If you force a presentation, a lot of times you don't get an ideal one because they will just kind of be done as fast as possible. How do you get students who are willing to how do you get students to be willing to present to the class? How do you keep how do you get your 
your sort of wallflowers to step to center stage and participate the way they need to? Good question, Liz. Um, uh, okay, we're playing a game. Alonzo and his team has been beating your team. You're on it. And one of the reasons your team has been doing poorly is that you've got a couple of shy people and you've got a slacker who's just not doing anything. So they're making arguments and you're, and it's, these intellectual issues are much too complicated for any one person to master them all. So you need the team to come together and your team is just doing a lousy job and you're giving a speech and they're not helping you out. You're trying to make an argument with them after with the, uh, with, with Alonzo's team and they're, they're picking apart your, your position and you, and you're confused and you look at your teammates and they're sitting there and they're not doing anything because they're shy or they're fearful. So what do you do? What do you do then? Well, often you'll say, guys, we've got to, we got to we got to work harder. We were that was humiliating. That was embarrassing. Did you see them making? Did you see the looks they were making about us? Um, and often the trajectory of a game is that one side gets way in advance because it's got some spark plug of leadership, and then the other side gets 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 pissed. And they know they can do better, and they haven't quite caught up. They didn't know they. They didn't really know that that they would be so so much on the spot. And the trajectory of many games is that one side gets in the, in the lead and they think it's easy. And the other side gets together, pulls their act together. They'll meet with the instructor to figure out, you know, what's coming up that we need to be better prepared for. And then they'll suddenly switch things that and the other side isn't ready for it. And they've sort of coasted. And very often the side that's that's got the, the initiative at the outset, the other side will reconstitute itself. The slacker will be motivated to, to, to do their share or to help out. Um, or your team, your slacker is not just a slacker, but someone who is swamped with, with a child they have to take care of and they simply can't do it. And you'll protect that person by doing more to help protect them. So um, you'll function as a team and you'll figure things out. And in doing that, you'll learn more and more about your teammates. And the whole class begins to interact in thick ways and become a community, which makes it actually easier to, to, to speak and argue and, have, and play a game. And in, in a reacting class, to my way of thinking, the best reacting classes are where you play two or three games during a semester. And so you change roles and factions and things and you play different games and uh, it creates a real, real community. There have been studies of reacting which have shown that students in reacting classes form more friends amongst the class much more rapidly. And most interestingly is that this the study of friendships is that usually Friendships in classes are based on socioeconomic um, uh, clustering so that you'll have similar sorts of students forming friendship cliques. In reacting, it shatters that because you've been, you've been assigned to a faction and you didn't recreate your friendship clique. So it makes a very rich sort of uh, uh, social community in a reacting game. And that's community is, is the essence of it. We'll just do... Are there still some slackers who don't do much? You bet. Um, it, that doesn't diminish the game very much at all because usually others in the faction will help them out or will make up for their 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 non-participation. So to go back to the beginning of your explanation, are you saying that defeat and maybe the sting of shame just a little bit can actually be a motivator in learning instead of something that's just discouraging? There's a chapter in my book called Learning by Failing. Um, I think that, that my best learning experiences have often come from failures. How about you? Oh, certainly. Yes. I, um, I, I, actually, there were multiple things that struck me when I was reading Minds on Fire. One is that it is true that even though I am a pretty 
enthusiastic student. You know, I went to University of Chicago because it's called the place where fun comes to die. You know, I like a little pain with my learning. Um, <laughs> it, it still really struck me, right? Yeah, most of my classes were kind of boring. Like the most important intellectual moments in my life happened outside of class. They happened when I was reading something either on my own or with someone I was really bonding with intellectually. And while I did not respond well to failure earlier in my life, you know, having to deal with it at, in college, in graduate school, really, I think, changed the way that my brain works and the way that I respond to setbacks now in my adult life. So absolutely, I do agree with that. And so what this does is it takes that psychological chastening element, but it does it in the context of a game. Okay, so you're playing a game. So some people are supposed to lose. You've got to have winners and losers. Okay, whereas when you're when you're in a uh, doing a dissertation or when you're you're in some other thing, everybody's supposed to succeed. But this is a game. It's a game context, and that takes some of the pressure off. Okay, uh, a student, you're part of a faction. You've got an important presentation. The whole your whole success depends on you're doing a good job, and you do a real good job. But Alonzo's Number two in their faction does a brilliant job, wins the vote, you lose, you feel like a failure, but it's a game, okay? And, and to me, that, that you need to have those sorts of failures, but it's best to have them in gaming context, which is, which is um, I think board gamers understand that, that very well, that uh, a lot of the fun of board gaming is that you don't always win. In fact, is I think it's a rule in in for people who are doing video games that the game cannot be mastered because if the game can be mastered, it's no fun. So most most video gamers have learned that the game has to be just challenging enough and always increasingly more challenging so that you never can be guaranteed to win it. Yeah, I think all games have to ride that line where if it's too easy, you get bored and you don't want to play it. If it's too right. hard and you really don't think you can win, then you're not going to play that game either. So you always have to have that like lore, like maybe I can get it this time. And yeah, that's what keeps you coming back. <laughs> yeah, we've learned in the game design that it's each of the rooms that you go to during the course of a game, usually you go to a different room during a different class, depending on, so like I mentioned for ancient Athens, one of the issues is should foreign born medics be given the vote? Another issue is that in, in ancient Athens, they gave all positions in the government were through a random lottery. Why would you do that? Well, because otherwise, if you vote, you end up electing uh, rich people or attractive people or charismatic people, and they end up getting too much power. So they give all jobs for one year randomly. Okay, and so this is another issue. Should they keep this system of random allocation of positions? Um, so each... Uh, the game would have uh, different rooms for each class where you debate different issues. All of them have the same sort of philosophical foundations, but different particular issues. So uh, each class would end with a decision point, which would be little victories and failures. So you might win one one day, the next class you win, you lose. And so it's, and then it culminates in the big full game. So, um, in a good reacting game, there will be lots of experiences where you, you can win and lose in little ways before the final game verdict comes in. So you touched on this in Minds on Fire some, but I want to ask about it more, which is, so when you are teaching your students, right, you obviously want them to connect to the material. One aspect of studying history is that, you know, every time you do history, you're doing what happened and also what story am I telling about what happened and what does that say about me? How... To what extent are students able to sort of bring modern sensibilities and concerns into a reacting game? Um, and is there a point at which that is off limits? Because honestly, when you're talking about Athenian democracy, I was like, wow, people never elect popular people who get too much power. That's never yeah. happened. Well, <laughs> you know, it, the, the... It, it's, it, it, I mean, it's what is, of course, what is wonderful is how Human history changes, human institutions change, but we're still arguing the same sorts of things, the, the same 
human dilemmas recur uh, in civilization after civilization and century after century. Um, the, the, all of the issues in the ancient Athens have overtones to the present. Okay, that's just, that is true. It is why you can watch a play by Euripides or a comedy by by Aristophanes and still laugh at those. They're still funny. This, this, the, the, they're still tragic in the same sort of way. The, 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 we are human beings with continuously uh, familiar problems. So some of this overlap of past and present is inevitable and it's wonderful. It's one of what history always changes. The, the historical interpretation of the past is always changing. And why is that? Because the present is changing. Um, and so the way you look at the past changes as well. So that the, the idea that you're playing a role in the past, but it's still speaking to you in the present, that's okay. That's okay, and that's, that's sort of how historians work. Um, the game is structured to hold you to the, the, a position which is historically plausible. So your victory objectives, you might say, well, my position as an oligarch is uh, that to choose people through random lottery for to be magistrates of the courts is crazy. Um, I, I, I know that. Um, and they might want to apply that sensibility to the to, to the, the past. Um, but if you're making the opposite role, you've, you've got, you would lose the game if you, if you uh, cease to do what you're supposed to do in your role project. So your roles hold you to the past, to historically plausible positions. If you say, I'm not going to say that, that's not what I think. Basically, you're saying, I'm not playing the game, so you lose the game. And, and, if you are a faction which is arguing that you want to keep the random lottery and and uh, someone says that's stupid, I'm not going to do that, then your job in the faction is say we're supposed to win and work. So you'll try to persuade them. So that's part of the structure of the game is to hold them to historical plausibility to make sure these are these ideas are articulated in ways that resonate with the past. But they will always there will always be echoes to the present. And so when there's the debate on giving immigrants, uh, whether to give immigrants uh, uh, citizenship rights. Um, just, I, I remember a, a student uh, um, who was herself a, uh, a, an immigrant speaking passionately against giving immigrant rights. And, uh, and she said, she said, but they are coming to Athens to make money. We Athenians who were born here, who, whose ancestors' bones are in the soil, if Athens loses again, we all have to leave, and we'd have to leave our ancestors, we'd have to leave our families, we'd have to live the community that, that has been our lives forever. And she was making an impassioned argument against uh, uh, immigrant rights, which, which were, was one of the best debates about immigrant rights I've heard because people didn't have to sidestep um, uh, uncomfortable things because it was said in the past. Um, so I do want to push on that, though, because yeah. not all of the reacting games are set that far in the past. You know, you've right. got games about apartheid. You've got games where somebody plays Calhoun. How do you create an atmosphere where students coming from all walks of life feel safe, either embodying things that are hateful to them or watching their classmates do so and having to handle it. Well, this this is this is that's an excellent question, and it's one that uh, uh, that we have something called the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, which is a, a, a group of scholars who who are in the reacting community who are addressing the, exactly these issues. And and to say that there is a orthodox position is false at least there, so far there isn't that there there are different there are different viewpoints in the reacting community among scholars some say for example if you're dealing with there is a, 
a, a game that's focusing on Frederick Douglass. Um, and some say that you need to have the pro-slavery position articulated uh, and, and articulated in passionate ways so that students can really feel the bite of, of the pro-slavery position. And otherwise, they're not understanding slavery. They're not understanding the horrors of slavery. Um, others in the community say that that bite is too, is too, is too painful. Um, it's, it's even here at Voiced is too painful. So s some say that uh, st uh, w there are different protocols that are being debated. One is that students can reject roles in, in those sorts of games that, are, that, they, that they don't want to hold. Another is to remind students that, that in playing a game, they're, they are sort of agreeing to a compact of exploring difference, um, ideas that they may find repugnant or reprehensible or just wrong. If the trial of Galileo, you argue, some will be arguing that the earth doesn't move. Um, and uh, uh, reminding people that, that to play, that they have to have all voices played and have some sense of what really was going on. They really need to let voices, even repugnant ones, be articulated. Um, but this is, it's fair to say that this is an issue that, that there is no orthodoxy yet. Uh, the, as I say, there's the, this, this committee that's trying to come up with protocols, but these are still debated and different instructors got out different positions on this. And some instructors, frankly, refuse to do games that are, de that deal with, that, that come too close with issues that are, uh, too sensitive. Let me give one example. One game that was developed was in development about 13 years ago was set during the 1960s and 70s, and it was on the debate in the American Psychiatric Association. And there's a parallel debate in the American Psychological Association over whether uh, homosexuality was a mental illness. And at the time, it was regarded as a clinical mental illness. And the game takes the point where this idea is being challenged, where psychologists and psychiatrists are, some are saying, no, it is not a mental illness. It's, you know, it's okay. You can imagine the whole debate. It's a, it was a wonderful game. And the board of the reacting consortium, which is the governing body said, no, we're stopping this game. We don't want students to articulate any student to say that uh, gay or lesbian behavior is a mental illness. And so we shut that game down. We stopped its development. And then about five years ago, some gay leaders uh, in New York approached me and said, why don't we have any games on, on exactly this issue? And I said, we did have a game, but we, we shut it down because it was too offensive uh, to, to articulate that position. They said, but that's part of the history of the movement that students don't know nowadays, and they need to know it. And to suppress that, is to deny a part of the history of the struggle that helps explain where we are today. And so we've changed our position on that. Um, and we've changed the position chiefly because the mindset, the attitude towards uh, gay LGBT, LGBTQ rights has changed very, very rapidly in the past few years. And that game is now, those issues are now, now can be voiced and probably need to be voiced. So that's an illustration of how how these issues, the context behind them can change. That makes a lot of sense. So I have a question that's just kind of a fun question, which is there are a bunch of different reacting to the past games out there that have been published. What is a time period or a topic that doesn't exist yet, but you hope will soon? We, we now have 30 published games and we have 320 in development. Okay, Ooh, so that's amazing. 320 in development. Yeah. So uh, I, I've, I've been hoping to, to develop a game on, on, on the history of calculus and mathematics. I'm not very good in that. I'm working with some other people to make that subject interesting to me would be a great challenge. Um, I can't say we've developed it yet. We, we, we've got, we've got a, a bunch of ideas and I'm exploring it. Uh, uh, 
I wish my calculus were stronger, but that's the sort of thing we're trying to do is, is, is to take really, really difficult issues and make them fun. So it sounds like you're also trying to expand to other subject areas, which is also something I wondered. So we talked about classes being boring, gamifying history classes as a way of making them more interesting, but can you apply that to math or science in ways that work? Cause I did not enjoy any math class ever my whole life. Although I did like many of my math teachers. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, about half of the half of the instructors in the reacting universe are historians, but we've got games now in that are focused on religion and political science. Of course, political science and history are very similar. Um, uh, history of physics, history of chemistry, climate change. So, uh, so we moved into the science field quite consciously. History of science issues. So, so. And we found that that you can have games based on f false understandings of science. Okay, so you can have students debate whether or not the Earth moves, and that's because the Aristotelian arguments for why the Earth doesn't move lasted for two thousand years because they're just brilliant. They're, I mean, I could spend an hour now with with you and persuade you using Aristotle that the Earth doesn't move, and the arguments are simply irrefutable which is why they lasted 2000 years. So, so we learned that, that, that science, science games can be, can be created. Uh, the, the, the Darwin game focuses on whether or not Darwin, not was, what is evolution right, but whether or not he deserved the Copley Medal of the Royal Society, which is based on, um, is science based on solid fact? That's, that's the uh, Francis Bacon's philosophy of science, which was the, the Holy Grail, or is the Bible of the Royal Society. And did Darwin make his assertions about the evolution of species? Was it based on fact or was it just brilliant deductions? So the, that game is, is Darwin science or was he just a good guesser? Um, so you can see there, there are ways to create games in the sciences. We are weak. We don't have... To my knowledge, we don't have any game in development that's that's come close to doing what you want in math. And that's one of the things that I've been working uh, with with a, a, a former student um, to do, and basically on on infinitesimals and the origin of calculus. Uh, we're not there yet. We don't have a fun game on that. Um, we don't have any fun games in economics either, and we hope to have that. Excellent. So. If someone wants to get involved with the reacting community or in touch with you or other people who are practicing this, I guess it's a pedagogical method at this point. Um, how do you, how do, how do they get in touch? Well, my guess is most of your audience who might be interested in this would be high school, would be high school uh, teachers or, or maybe graduate students in multiple disciplines. Um, graduate students are easy that they can get, they can, get access to all of the secret stuff too. You have to basically be an educator, a college educator to get access to the role sheets and the instructor manuals and stuff. And that's that's something you can get uh, for free if, once we've confirmed that you are indeed an educator. Basically all you need to do is uh, Google reacting to the past and you'll eventually find our, our main website. It's not that hard. Um, or you, I think that's, isn't that how you did? Didn't you get to our main website by Googling reacting? I am sure that I did. Google is magical in that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that, that will, that would take you in you at the main website. You can, there's a, uh, um, thread to go to instructors and you basically then ask for access to the materials or the website will show you the things that have been published. If, if you're, if you're a college instructor and you're, you're not a Google sort, you could send an email to me. Um, again, uh, I'm not that hard to find if you, you've got my name out there. So, uh, um, and we'll get you to connect to the website. And what we're doing this summer, we, the main way that faculty learn about doing reacting is by playing reacting games. And this summer we've been doing it last summer as well, chiefly online. So we use, we send the materials out a few weeks in advance. You read the materials, you're assigned a role, and then you'll be playing, doing Zoom playing for faculty training workshops. And there's, in fact, there's one going on right now um, 
in our game development conference, which is a another subunit which develops new games. And the game that's going on right now is called The Rage of Achilles. And it's really based on, the, not on history, but on the, uh, on the Iliad. And it's, it's a new concept of taking reacting not into the past of history, but, but into literature, using it, uh, reacting as a way of role playing to understand literary themes. It's a new concept. Um, but we do online faculty training workshops and also we all we play test games. And basically you just connect you, you, uh, 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 if you're in college instructor, um, you can get into this whole process. If you're a high school instructor, you can send us an email and we connect you to the task force, which is trying to decide whether reacting is suitable for high school students. The task force preliminary answer is yes. Um, some games maybe no. Um, some games maybe need to be adjusted for for high school play, but well, I can put you in touch with them. But that, that we no longer are placing an embargo on high school students, on high school instructors, rather. Fantastic. So for those of you who are curious out there, you can look up Reacting to the Past. You can look up Professor Karn's book called Minds on Fire. And you can find me anywhere online as Beyond Solitaire. Thank you so much for coming on, Professor Karns. It's been great to have you. Liz, it's, I've enjoyed uh, talking with you. That's great questions. Thanks, everybody. Leave us a comment and happy gaming.